Happy New Year to you, our dear esteemed viewers. Welcome back to this week's weekly episode of the Inter University Debates. This week, we are joined by a panel of distinguished ladies and gentlemen who will help us unpack the conversation. Tonight, we are talking about what the non aligned movement, NAM, means for the Ugandan youth. But also, we shall put into perspective the South African genocide case against, against Israel. Otherwise, my name is Douglas Drekonen. I'm your host and moderator for this week's show. Joining me in the studio, I'll let them introduce themselves and uh, we shall get to know them, but the usual faces and usual suspects on the show. Otherwise, you're almost welcome. I'll begin with the gentleman as I come back to the ladies. <laughs> yes, Drake, thank you so much for hosting me today. I am Philip Melissa, a journalist by training and a very proud African, happy about the progress we are making, especially when I look at a country like South Africa, do what it does at the ICJ, I'm impressed. But also, you know, we have a Ugandan judge on that panel, so I can't be happy as an African. Thank you for hosting me. Definitely. I'm very happy to have you here and waiting to put into perspective those insights. And a lady that has been here before, um, she's a lady of very many titles, but today she'll go ahead and say hello and tell us what exactly she is. But I know she's a very passionate Pan-Africanist, as you can see with the hair. You wow. must welcome. Thank you so much. And it's always a pleasure to be um, hosted. It always feels home. Uh, my name is Denise Ayebare. I'm a student uh, of the law at Macquarie University and a passionate Pan-Africanist. I'm African, just holding a Ugandan passport. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Um, Denise, I'm very happy to have you here. Today you're a passionate oh, Which you do not need. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. We, we must freely move into the, the African continent. But very happy to have you here. The lady who was joining us for, for the first time with a glittering smile. Very happy to have you here. Um, please go ahead and say hello. Okay. Hello, everyone. It's a very huge pleasure to be a part of this panel, especially with the topics of discussion today. My name is Apili Cynthia Esther. I am a student at Macquarie University Business School of Leadership and Governance, and I'm in my first year. Aside from that, I am a passionate uh, youth and gender activist and also very focused on issues concerning uh, peace and conflict resolution. I'm very happy and delighted to be here. All right. Um, I see the panel has a couple of uh, very robust young people. <laughs> very happy to have you all here. Let's uh, usually the ladies begin the conversation, but since we have the only gentleman on the show, I think it's prudent <laughs> that we start the conversation with you. I can see a smiling. Definitely, I'll start with you now. Um, let's talk about um, the NAM summit that is happening now in Uganda. Maybe as a way of introduction <coughs> for the young people who are out there who would like to put NAM into perspective. Kindly unpack it for them in the simplest way possible, but then bring them up to speed. Why, uh, why exactly Uganda is hosting this? Mm. Uh, thank you, Drake. Now, the non-aligned movement, in the simplest terms, <coughs> is uh, the interpretation of the, of the word non and the word aligned. In other words, you can call it the neutral movement. Neutral from what? Global power politics. Mm. And uh, when you relate to its inception in 1961, but also the conversations that led to that effect, resulting from uh, the start of uh, the Korean War, what is famously known as the Korean War, 1950, you had countries that had just gained their independence at the time. To be specific, you had Yugoslavia at the time, but also India and a couple of others who thought they, they would not be caught in the global superpower politics at the time. Remember in the war you had um, the bipolar powers of the world at the time, the USSR and uh, the side that had the United States of America, one supporting North Korea and the other, the southern part of Korea. Now, these two countries that were still very poor, very trying to reorganize themselves, thought they shouldn't get into the contention of who is who and where do we fall and where do we align. So they, they came up with an idea, I think it was in the United Nations General Assembly of that year, 
that the then president of uh, Yugoslavia stated that for them as Yugoslavia, they did not want to align with any of uh, the military, you know, pacts and wings that were at the time. More specifically, NATO for the people that supported South Africa and uh, rather South Korea and uh, the Warsaw Pact for the USSR. And he said they want to be non-aligned in those conflicts. They want to be who they are and not be on either side. And he got support from the then Prime Minister of India, Jawaharlal Nehru, then talk about Egypt, Gamal Abdel Nasser, talk about Kwame Nkrumah, the great of Africa, the Osajifo, talk about Sukhanov, Indonesia, and conversations kept on happening until 1955. They had a conference in Indonesia to talk about this and how they can institutionalize it. And uh, this, converse, this conference led to later in 1961, setting up this institution organization called the Nanana Aligned Movement. So these five countries that I've mentioned, Indonesia, uh, Yugoslavia, India, Ghana, and Egypt, very happy that we had two African countries on that one, where the starting agents of this movement. And uh, it continued to work. From 1961, it, it had its impact on apartheid South Africa. Mm -hmm. to talk about uh, the issues in Palestine still were center stage in their engagements. Then the independence of states in uh, South America, they, they still had a voice on those particular issues. Fast forward through, we know, 19, uh, starting 1991. Yugoslavia got some challenges, you know, the, the mm -hmm. tribal conflicts that came in and how uh, it was dissociated into six states now, six, seven, mm -hmm. Croatia, Montenegro, many of those. So, and uh, coming now to 2023, having it in Uganda is yet another opportunity to highlight the importance of such an institution in the world. Mm -hmm. More so in light of uh, a couple of challenges that in the world talk about climate change, talk about the conflict in uh, Gaza, talk about the conflict in Ukraine, talk about the many unfair global systems from the World Trade Organization, from the multilateral lending agencies, IMF and World Bank, and a couple of others. So briefly, that is what NAM is, and here we are in Uganda. Interesting. Um <clears throat> That's a very detailed introduction to what NAM is. And I, I believe for the viewers out there who are watching and getting to understand what the non aligned movement is, where they listen to your submission, definitely they'll get up to speed. And now let's bring it to today. The context today is on 15th of uh, January 2023, 2024, mm -hmm. in the new year, 2024, um, Uganda ho is hosting a couple of 350 delegates from 170 countries, 53 African countries, um, 20, 20, 20, 29 yeah. uh, from Asia, and then we have 15 from Latin America and I think two from Europe. All those delegates present, their presence in Uganda means something. And the conversation today is one that we want, what does this summit mean for the Ugandan youth? And Uganda in Africa is, uh, I, th I think, the second youngest after, the, it's the second youngest country in, in the continent. Mm -hmm. And that presents opportunities for young people. But let's just now unpack the conversation. What does this mean for young people? Denise, um, Philip gives us a very wonderful introduction. Young people are commenting on, on the media, are saying a lot. But let's just look at the intricacies that this, uh, this summit presents to the young people. Mm -hmm. Please. All right, uh, thank you so much. So for far too long, uh, not only Uganda, but African countries have been grappling with several externalities, whether it is trade or whether it's low bargaining power in any of the international agencies and international organizations. So you find that there is a generation of young people, there is a generation that does not want anything to do with the superpowers, whether it's the Eastern Bloc or it is the Western Bloc, 
you find that individuals are finding a way to develop Africa. Let's uh, get to the conversation of what this means to Ugandan youth in perspective. So of recent, we have had a lot of uh, maybe rise, rise up in things like the African continent of free trade area. We have had rise up in where individuals want to push blocks, East African blocks, like the Comesa or the East African community or anything. And this is a new wave. This is a new generation that wants to determine what their future looks like, that want to determine not to deal with the imperialism, the neocolonialism, the neoliberalization that is existing. And I think this is what exactly NAM does. Um, as you look uh, over how 2023 went for Uganda, I think it's one where we were losing a lot of uh, maybe donor organizations, but then to also international organizations were leaving the country, many of them. What this showed to the international community that does not align itself with any of the blocks is that, you know what, Uganda has the potential to actually be non-aligned, to be neutral within anything that is happening and to determine the kind of future that it wants. So to the Ugandan youth, it presents a better Uganda, but I think it also presents a better Africa where Uganda is taking lead in setting precedence towards the future of Africa, the young Africans is going to look like. Because when you look at things like um, the trade, how you're trying to promote things like inter-trade within the African continent, why you're trying to create um, African countries to become visa-free for each other, where you're trying to say that, you know what, Africa is for Africans. What you need to buy, you buy Uganda, build Uganda. So when you see the kind of initiatives that are coming about, this I think is a very good thing for Uganda youth themselves to determine the kind of future that they want. And I think it is something that our forefathers like Kwame Nkrumah, uh, Abdel Gamel Nasser would really want to see because this is the Africa they dreamt of. And Uganda taking, um, taking the lead shows the potential and shows the future a brighter future for the Ugandan youth, but also the African youth at large. Yeah. Beautiful. Um, better Uganda, better Africa. Um, Cynthia, let's take the conversation to the opportunities that this presents. Denise highlights trade, and the Nanaline movement presents endless possibilities. An opportunity for Africa, since all 53 African countries are in Uganda at the moment, and they're all present in this summit. There are possibilities of pushing the agenda of possibly having a visa-free Africa or having a free movement and a free movement of goods and services, which presents endless opportunities for young entrepreneurs who are engaged in the business sector. Let us now delve deeper into understanding how exactly this non-aligned movement summit uh, presents conversations in relation to boosting of trade and presenting more opportunities for young people. Thank you very much, Jake. So <clears throat> not diverting so much from what Denise tells you, is the understanding of NAM, you realize that in as much as there is a vast diversity of countries, for example, from per se South America, you have from Europe, there is that element of recognition of identity. That is why when you say NAM, you're able to say Africanacity, you're able to say that Africa still gets a chance to push for what they feel is necessary for the regions within Africa. Mm. So I think when it comes to things like entrepreneurship and business-wise for youth, you get to understand that pushing for things like visa-free for most of the African countries or for all, then means that we as a youth within Africa, within Uganda, are getting the diverse knowledge of understanding. For example, what sells in Uganda and what can sell in Ghana what sells in Ghana and what can sell in South Africa. Meaning that there is that freedom to move and you have the access to the enlightenment and empowerment you need to develop not only as an individual, but to develop your business as well. So I feel like for most of the youth within Africa, within Uganda, this presents an opportunity for them to not only push for those entrepreneurship skills that they have, but to create a market of assessment to understand what it is they need to engage in, mm. where it will actually sell, and why engage in that. You notice how entrepreneurship within Africa has taken a turn from the normal business we know to tailor-made businesses. This means that the businesses intend to address a particular challenge. <clears throat> For example, if someone is setting up a let me say a, an agriculture business, you know that you're going to supply food to a country that 
does not produce that amount of food that they need to sustain their population. So that free movement, <clears throat> things like reduced tariffs, enable that trade to happen, mm -hmm. but also gives young people the hope they need to actually thrive within that entrepreneurial type of sector. Beautiful. Um, what a pick from your submission. You uh, say, as I quote, tailor-made businesses. And this introduces something that I want Philip to talk about, which is in relation to innovation. Um, Philip, among the fundamental principles of the NAM, among the 10, I'm first of all interested in respect for fundamental human rights and for the purposes and principles of the Charter of the United Nations, respect for human rights. And of course, respect for human rights comes with it the aspect that you need when you, you when it comes to aspects of, of of innovations and all you need to provide the opportunity provide the resource to help young people thrive now the non aligned movement does it present that opportunity that will boost our innovation among young people in uganda thank you and i really appreciate the deliberations made by colleagues here First, first and foremost, we must understand that uh, in the heart of uh, the founders of the NAM, one of the key elements or the key tenets of the foundation of it is uh, <clears throat> that this institution should be one that uh, respects sovereignty of states. Mm -hmm. They want you to be non-aligned but they do not interfere with what you do as, a, as an individual, which I think is a, a weak side of the institution. We know that uh, most, what I can call most serious institutions like, uh, say, COAS in West Africa, say, IGAD, say, the European Union, if you do not match certain standards, you are sanctioned, either told to suspended maybe, or told to pay fines to some level now. When you say, does NAM address the issue of creating such opportunities for young people? Does NAM address human rights? Does NAM address social services in the communities? No, it doesn't. It is rather a someone in the words of someone, what he called uh, a distinctive, highly glorified talk show, where people come to talk about these things, but there is no major deliberation to make sure these things are achieved. And I'll give you an example. In the foundation, they were saying you should not be, you shouldn't have signed military cooperation with either the NATO or the Warsaw Pact. But also they said they would not support someone who comes into leadership unconstitutionally. But over time we've seen, in fact, most of the countries in this block now have leaders that came in through military coups, have leaders that came in through guerrilla warfare, have leaders that came through unconstitutional means, but they have not been sanctioned in any way. They have not been advised to do things better in any way and they are they are welcomed the same way others are welcomed so but 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 philip isn't that the respect of sovereignty mm -hmm. that that their principles provide because it doesn't matter how whether legitimate or, Ill, or illegitimate that you came into power what matters is the sovereignty that the state has drake society evolves and if you do not evolve with society you stand the risk of being very weak. And I will tell you, one of the reasons NAM is not highly respected as it should be is because of that weakness. So, they've failed to evolve. Hmm. Maybe let me first make this point. They've refused to evolve to the extent that when they put out a statement, I, I, I can give you a very, a very minor example. You know, recently Uganda has had very bad publicity in regard to the LGBT law we passed and a couple of other geopolitical differences we have with nations in the West. Today, the second most powerful international conference is happening in this country. I want you to check on your phone or wherever you check. Most of the international media houses from Europe and the America, the BBC, the CNN, Fox, they, were, they have deliberately ignored to report about this conference. 
I dare yeah. you, if this conference had the power to put, to put out a statement the same way NATO does, and they say, Mr. Drake, if you do not do this, we are going to take you out of that office. These media houses would have come and reported about this event. True. That is, that is not light. True. Yes. That is undisputed and totally undisputed. But the fact is, NAM is a body that is, first of all, not formally recognized. It has no act. It has no charter. It's just, as you said, a highly glorified um, talk show. Yes? So how can we then front an agenda if it's a highly glorified talk show? Because young Ugandans maybe have aspirations. Job opportunities have been created. Influencers are getting money out of it and all that. How can we then make, um, is there a possibility of um, maybe in the future, because all of you have introduced yourselves as passionate Pan-Africanists, all 53 African countries are here. Is there a possibility of having, coming up with a, 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 maybe a recognized agenda that would make NAM more recognizable and powerful and respected by the Western world? Yes. That's a question of solidarity and consistency. I'll give an example. Today, the East African community is, is disintegrated. Uganda disagrees with Kenya every other day. Uganda disagrees with Rwanda every other day. Uganda disagrees with uh, DRC every other day. Rwanda is almost <coughs> on conflict with DRC. Burundi. South Sudan <laughs> that <laughs> just <laughs> came in recently is saying, Uganda, we cannot import maize from you. Somalia just came in recently and they want to, in fact, they are at, at the verge of having a conflict with Ethiopia today over Somaliland and the agreements that are there in. How do you expect this country to respect things in the non-aligned movement where there is no enforcement, where there is no authority where there is no consensus. What am I saying? There is no enforcement body or mechanism. These countries must get commuted. Today you have 120 members. You are supposed to have 120 heads of state in this country. How many are here? You will tell me maybe after the conference. If it were, I have not seen a single NATO conference where there is any president that misses deliberately. But the previous conference in Azerbaijan, very few attended. The previous one in Venezuela, mm -hmm. extremely few attended. In Uganda, uh, the, the, the details I looked at said they expect anything between 40 to 50 presidents, uh, uh, less than 50%. That's a sign of no commitment. And I'm not saying it is irrelevant. Let me tell you, if I, the, the colleagues here talked about the benefits of what it presents. For a country like Uganda, for example, you must understand that uh, having 120 countries, you, might, you also know we have the G77 soon in line, you have uh, more than two-thirds of global population looking at Uganda. A country in Asia knows our president went to Uganda. A country in South America knows our president is in Uganda. It is a great of opportunity for Uganda to position itself geopolitically. Mm -hmm. geopolitically. The president is, is going to become the chief diplomat of this institution for the next three years. That is lobbying power in every block of the world, lobbying power for our president. We have a bad image as a country recently. How are we going to use this now to clear that image? We have the power. Many lobby groups are going to be coming into this country to lobby from the president because he endorses the position of the 120 countries in anywhere in the United Nations, in the European Union, talk about trade and so on. We have that tap power. Number two, tourism. I can tell you if Uganda positioned itself so well, which we did not, you saw the things we are doing, including roads. We started two months ago to construct roads for now. Two months ago, yet we, we had this information three years ago. What am I saying? If we had positioned ourselves very well for tourism, 6.4 billion people, what have we done to make sure that people in those countries know what Uganda has to offer? Have we done an, ad an advertisement in those countries? Did we okay say CGTN, the China Television Network, has a lot of influence in Asia? 
Let's go there and put out something that talks about Uganda, such that the people in Asia, when the president comes, even before he comes, many people are saying, oh, before our president visits Uganda, let us also go there and see what they have to offer. Do the same in South America. You would come to Uganda and you have the 5,000 delegates that are coming for NAM, but you have another 2 million people coming as tourists. That is economic advantage for the country. Did we do that? No, we didn't. Right. We even put out posters three days to the, sh to, to the conference <laughs> on the roads of Kampala. <laughs> it's all right. Denny, listening to uh, Philip, I feel an ache in my heart. And what has happened to Uganda? Are we these people who, when you, a visitor calls and they tell you, I am coming tomorrow, that is when you pick the broom and sweep the house, clear the cobwebs. The same thing is, that is happening in Uganda now. Send away border borders off the streets. Paint even where you're not supposed to paint. <laughs> Two days. <laughs> and we want to position ourselves strategically. And yet the young people are hopeful and optimistic and ooze an aura of, of innovation, of uh, passionate young activists such as yourselves on this panel. What has happened? What is wrong? Does it mean that if this conference ends, the opportunities will cease? Or shall we maybe have room for better days to come? All right. Uh, so you see, Nam is just um, listening to Philip. It's just that I have an ally, but I'm not going to tell you who my ally is. Or I'm subscribing to this, but I'm not going to subscribe. I'm not going to tell you who I'm subscribing to. And I think there is a major big problem, I think, with Uganda in terms of preparation, but also in terms of what we want for the young people, but what we want as a country. Because most of the times, even when we have different other conferences or anything, our publicity has always been little or you just know something when it has ended. And you see, Ugandans are people that move on very fast. They're just going to make uh, memes out of it because this is what is left for the young people. They do not see any opportunities. Because if you have maybe New Vision, Daily Monitor, or Bukede, or any other media houses telling you that you're going to host now, did you see any job advertising for influencers to come up and probably take up these jobs? Or where they were asking uh, young people to go and volunteer for the NAM? These are all like closed conferences where you do not hear of these opportunities young people are supposed to get. And I think it's something that we have mastered within also the job sphere or anything. The kind of advancement we do not do because you already have your own people who are going to do this or you're not providing an opportunity for young people to carry out the kind of uh, any, anything they could offer to the country or anything they could offer to now. So you find it's very problematic. But then the second thing, as we position ourselves, I think we need to position ourselves in a way that gives us uh, more leverage or more bargaining power. But when you look at how NAM is and what you talk about, most of the NAM countries, the member, the member states of NAM, are having issues within their own countries. Or if we say we are going to maintain sovereignty of these countries, you're going to find that the kind of externalities that you have on these countries do not even give us that lobbying power as we want our president to have. Because if I give an example, you're going to look at countries, um, the neocolonialism that is happening within African countries only does not allow you to have that kind of lobbying power as NAM. You're going to see the external pressure that exists on these countries does not let them remain neutral. When I tell you, you've never seen someone else maybe from Europe looking for a job. You're going to find someone from Venezuela looking for a job. Venezuela has the is the biggest country that is producing oil in this country. It has the largest oil, it has the largest oil barrels that is existing within this country, within the world. But you're going to find that individuals are actually looking for jobs from Venezuela. Why? Because they do not have the kind of money. And when they decided to see to set a test for their own economy, they were sanctioned. I think this is a country that received a loan from the World Bank. And um, the prime minister received a lot of pressure and sent back the money to the World Bank. Immediately, the country was sanctioned. They do not benefit from their own oil. But coming back to Africa, Tunisia produces the best olives within the entire globe. But what happens, they're going to tell you that that olive oil comes from Italy. When you look at the flowers that are produced in Kenya, here in Naivasha, those are one of the best quality roses that you have. 
But these roses are exported to countries like uh, the Netherlands. You're going to find them in Amsterdam showing up, and they're going to tell you they're produced in uh, Netherlands or anything. So you find that the okay. So you find that the externalities that exist, the countries, the circumstances with which these countries exist in, does not allow them to actually be neutral. So you find that those problems do not even give you a higher lobbying power, just like we would want to agree that you know what, if uh, Mr. President is going to be the chairman for the next three years from 2024 to 2027, then what is it going to mean for Uganda? What is it going to mean for the entire member states that exist within the NAM? So you find we have a lot of differences. We have a lot of uh, problems or there is a lot of influence there is a lot of pressure that has been put on these countries. You, you see, maybe if I, if I can uh, help be build on that one. Mm -hmm. When she talks about what we, we achieve as a country, you must understand that hosting 50 or be it 10 presidents in a country, plus a couple of other delegates that are coming in, we are spending money. When a, a I don't know, high level leader comes from Singapore, do not think that when they land at the airport, the car they sit in, you first ask for money for fuel to put mm -hmm. in the car so that you can transport them. That's that is government of Uganda money. The car they are driving is government of Uganda car. When you take them to Munyonyo, that's a government of Uganda facility. All they pay for is maybe the accommodation they are doing at Serena or wherever. But we invest a lot of money in them. A lot of money. Now, government should be looking at how do we get back this money. It is... We got loans. This is money we borrowed. We didn't have this kind of money. We borrowed, but we've not invested in things that should return this money, yet we have to pay it back with profit. With profit. It's painful, Drake. So uh, I think that's one of the things that I wanted to point out. What we are investing in is painting pavers. What we're investing in is making sure that now none of the businesses exist on that Munyonyo road. The businesses are being halted. These are individuals uh, that do not have a livelihood. Most of the Ugandans are living below the poverty line. They are working uh, from uh, hands to mouth. So you see that the kind of inconveniences that have been caused within the country, business as usual is not going on or they're not operating. And yet the economy is already doing bad. So you find that the money is, that is being injected within the system, within the economy, is little or no more. Because border border men are not operating, they're going to tell you that this road is not being used. Yeah. You're going to find that individuals cannot go to work. But three, you're going to find that the street vendors who are getting most of the money out of uh, what they do on the streets are not getting the money. But noticing and recognizing that most of the Ugandans are, vo are involved in SMEs and they're involved in informal businesses. That's where they get their money from. So just a slight inconvenience is going to make the economy harder for them that is already hard. You find that the existing circumstances they're already living in are terrible, they are bad, they are detrimental. So Maybe in addition to that, to the terrible situation they are in, the loan we take is still on them to pay it to back. Pay. So. so you find that you're going to be highly burdened by the kind of taxes that are going to come up. You have to pay taxes on almost everything. So. The kind of, um, you see, Uganda is trying to position itself, but the things we invest in as a country also should matter for the citizens because it's a two-way thing. Uh, as the citizens are playing their role, the government is expected to play their role for the citizens. I think Ugandans are one of the people that hustle so much, but the economy, the government has actually failed them in promoting maybe friendly investments. It is becoming highly indebted. The kind of trade that is taking place does not benefit them. And this is... Uh, but, but then going to what the future looks like, because I think that was uh, the question. What does it mean for Uganda and where has Uganda gone wrong? I think in terms of priorities, because we're going to prioritize, um, it is okay for us to be neutral, to have the kind of uh, global image that we have lost over the year, over 2023, to have that kind of image uh, brought back. But then the things we do to make sure that we get back that image, how do we benefit from Hosting the NAM, the money we have spent, the airport looks fabulous. But where are we going to get that kind of money that we have invested in the airport? If we are going to spend people's taxes, what are the citizens of Uganda going to see where the money is going? Well, noticing that the kind of infrastructures 
Hospitals, as you can see on the news, hospitals, Lua Hospital and all the other entities are asking for more money to build their infrastructures. And these are some of the money that is being said that, you know what, we do not have the money, you need to halt. URA, on the other hand, is asking for money to have more workers. So you find where we put our priorities is one that is lacking. Because there is no way you're going to tell a person, um, probably in um, the remote areas, and tell them, you know what, your money went in NAM. The kind of taxes you pay went in NAM. As someone who is not having anything to eat, as someone who cannot afford to take their children to school, mm -hmm. as someone who cannot access the free health services. <clears throat> so then where does this leave us as a country? We need to prioritize things that matter for the citizens. To even on um, a higher bargaining power as a country, I don't think this is something that can be achieved that easily. Because the countries that subscribe to NAM themselves have a low bargaining power because most of them are global south countries. You're going to look um, in uh, Latin America or you're going to look at Asia or Africa. These are countries that do not have even the ability to pass a resolution at any of the international organizations or any of the international conferences that are happening. So you find we need to prioritize things that give us a direct benefit which our citizens can see that they benefit. We can argue about the long run and say that as we are coming up with another generation, these are individuals that are passionate about Pan-Africanism. Mm. These are individuals that are passionate about knowing how we can use our own resources or how we can position ourselves. But in the short run, what are the citizens looking at? Where is this going to leave us highly indebted? We cannot even finance our own budget. We shall have to borrow more. Where does this leave other structures? Because the only thing you're going to do is, you know what? We're going to, um, the potholes that exist within the Mnyonyo Road or anything, we're just going to do that. That's a short run thing. There are very many roads that are not done in Uganda, the hospitals, the schools. So you find we need to make our priorities right as a country and see what benefits the citizens more. Yeah. All right. Oh, Cynthia. Yes. Been somewhat quiet. Let me engage you. Um, but the borders, um, the border border industry in Uganda employs a couple of young people, and since it employs a couple of young people, they use it for their survival. That's where they derive the sustenance from, and unfortunately, very many of them in in Kampala have been affected. Businesses along Entebbe Road, Munyonyo, have been halted, as Denise has pointed out. And a couple of businesses, even in, on the streets of Kampala, have been halted because Uganda has to present a good image. Question is, short run, the impact, I would like you to assess the impact that that is, as the news is bringing it out, I'd like you to go deeper, the impact that this is going to have on border borders, on people who generally survive on the hand-to-mouth economy. But then too, we have a government that has an average age of 65 years old. And the ideas that young people have are one that could push this country forward. How can we then have young people involved in maybe planning stages to give these, should I call them old people? They <laughs> I think need that, capacity building. <laughs> yeah, I feel like we need more intergenerational um, relationship between the young and old to give them ideas on how to better move this country because it seems like they run out of ideas because this is an opportunity to push or boost tourism. What you say? Okay, I would want to first respond to a couple of issues before I even get to that question. In in a back and forth, the ideology of of NAM being based on the principle of legitimacy of governments came up, and Jake's argument was, don't you think that is then respect to things like sovereignty? And a key thing that he talked about was the aspect of evolution and the world accepting to evolve. Right. So when you talk about things like sovereignty, I feel these are concepts that cannot be given that level of respect when they are going to genuinely affect the people that even make up that state. The reason as to why you assess things like the existence of cools and whatnot is the sort of political systems that African countries have. For example, the series of coups that have happened in West Africa. These are countries that grapple with a lot of political development within these countries just as they are. So it is going to be difficult for an organization like NAM to dissociate from such a country in the claim of legitimacy or sovereignty. Even at a point in time where 
the sovereignty in and out of itself does not benefit the development of the country, does not benefit the country as a whole. Then I think just... Thank you. If you allow me a second in that, in that particular note, the sovereignty. What is sovereignty when people cannot eat, when people cannot sleep, when people cannot go to education, exactly. when there is no medicine in the hospitals, mm -hmm. when pupils are not getting quality education, housing? What is sovereignty in that aspect? I'll give you an example. In South Africa, the Nelson Mandela Bay is a constituency Nelson Mandela represented just after he came to pres you know it's a parliamentary system he was MP then elected president just less than uh, 30 years as he's out that constituency today is governed by a white person from actually a white uh, I forget the, his name and uh, he beat three Africans to that spot but you would want to imagine in a society with majority Africans who know what the white man did to them very few years ago until 1991 they would not allow a white to govern them really so so quick as that but when these black people look at the table and they ask okay our fellow countrymen are in power what have they given us how are we? How is our medical system? Is it any different from what the whites were bringing us? You force them to think, oh, maybe these whites had a better plan than, than our <laughs> countrymen have. And, and that's how you see it. A white man in the constituency that was with Nelson Mandela. It could be another constituency, but where Nelson Mandela was represented, it is unusual. Now, that is the point she's raising. Yes, sovereignty is important, but in that sovereignty, then you do not sit on the rights and the, what is supposed to yeah. be for the citizens. Mm -hmm. You do not, please. Yes. So um, moving on, another thing that Denise mentions is how fast as Ugandans we move on from things. You see, as, as young people, as youth, we are going to easily create a meme out of something and move on from it. We would say, okay, we are very unserious people, but assessment on the disillusionment that exists among young people is extremely important. And I feel like there is a need to classy up the acts. We are not going to constantly point out what the challenges are and fail to utilize what is in front of us. We want to say, yes, NAM has come in, it has inconvenienced the economy, there are a lot of people who are grappling with poverty and they have been greatly affected. But then at the end of the day, the question then becomes, with the existence of the opportunity that is in front of us, what can then be done? If you know that the economy is being sustained by, subsist uh, by subsistence farmers, people who are working to feed themselves in a day it is not sustained capital right so what are you doing within per se things like the economic committee in nam to address the challenges for your country for your people and i think when you talk about how young people need to actually be given a space to be involved you raise a very valid point because these are the people who are directly experiencing what the effects of this grappling economy are. For example, you're not going to expect someone that has been an MP for a particular constituency for over 10 years, who doesn't understand, even with basic consultations, it is difficult to understand when these people go back to their home districts, to understand what the individual challenges or group challenges are within these particular constituencies. So still in the evaluation of how far beyond organizations like NAM can go, because NAM even having member state countries does not exist with only the member state countries. There, there is an inclusion of organizations, for mm. example, the African Union. You get. So in as much as we don't have the strength of that lobbying or bargaining power, the ability to stand on some of the policies that we feel are trivial or vital to our nations is a beginning point to standing on what is necessary for your economy. And then to the question of how people have been affected, for example, you see the border borders and all that. 
One is to understand that, yes, they make up their economy, and yes, they have greatly been affected. They are not making money out of the situation, and this means that poverty even worsens. But see, COVID pushed people to be effective and innovative, not just innovative, but the effectiveness, right? So we cannot argue to say that this is the last of what is happening. Yeah. There are other challenges that are going to come. And I think it is far-fetched when at every given opportunity, you are going to find a reason to blame the poverty on. The point then becomes, if one entity fails, what are you pushing yourself to? There is need to diversify as an individual. And I think then the problem becomes the capacity for this individual to diversify. Because I may have the idea, I may have the knowledge, I may be as creative as possible, but do I have the capacity to diversify? And I think then that entirely goes back on the aspect of priorities and what government does. So as activists, as passionate people, we are going to scream for things like civic engagement, we are going to scream for things like youth involvement, and we are grappling for a space just to be involved. But then the question is, does government give that allowance? And I think this now becomes a point where government needs to classy the act and stop letting consistent problems continue. Mm -hmm. It's unfortunate that those consistent problems is where they benefit from. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, so, so definitely, if, if someone is minting or someone is minting or benefiting from something, I believe they would want to continue minting from that problem, yeah. which is unfortunate. Uh, but we have leaders who know, know of the problem, know of the solution, but do not act upon it. So should we then, as young people, come up with alternatives? Which I, be I believe it's not the solution. How because will they survive? Yeah, how will they survive? But also the principles of, of, of NAM provides for NAM use of force. <laughs> so, oh, so, so, wow. If you allow me to say something on that, you see, in philosophy there is a concept called arrivism. And it's uh, something almost all African leaders have been diagnosed with. <laughs> the state in which you get to a certain position and you think, and yes, this right. is the climax. And when you're in that state, then what you practice is protectionism because you don't want to leave that point. You want to stay at that point. What happens with protectionism? You have to suppress everyone you consider a threat. They might not be a threat, but you will consider them a threat. I'm very careful with the words I'm using. Now, that is something happening in Africa but also in majority of the countries that are in the non-aligned movement. And when that happens, do not expect people to create space for the innovation you talked about, for the, to talk about creating the, the jobs and economic empowerment and human rights, because protectionism, protection, it is, to the person being protected is a good thing, but it involves violence, oftentimes the person who is being considered an enemy or a threat. So that protectionism in all these people has created all the challenges we have on this continent, in Asia, in South America. Of course, there are a couple of other challenges, geopolitical influence and neocolonialism and, and so on. They are also there, yeah. but they are basics. And this we've not done. I'll give you an example. We're talking about how to benefit from the non-aligned movement and positioning. I've been following, looking at the delegates and how they arrive, and I haven't seen a country, say Singapore, they are not powerful militarily, but their economy is very okay, and they have, they have the potential to come and invest in our economy. The least Uganda could do is go to Singapore get a local TV or radio station from Singapore, come with their delegation here, film their president, their prime minister, their ministers, whoever came to this country, film them touring the source of the Nile or the source of the Nile. It took 200 years for the British to know where it was. They were so new. 
film him at Mount Renzori, mm. maybe film him at Lake Victoria having Obu Jagali Falls, the, the, the best fall you can ever find in the world, Makshon Falls, the best national park and falls you will ever find in the world, Kidepo Valley, everything, everything best in the world is in this country. Food. The best weather in the world, weather. Yeah. There, there is a, a research that was done and they were saying 39% of tourists travel because of weather. They are looking for good weather. And Uganda, according to the international weather something something, is the country with the best weather in the world. Next to it is Ecuador. Filming a president of a country touring and maybe having our president mm -hmm. as the guide is the best publicity you will do for this country. Mm -hmm. And people in that country will look at that clip and say, I want to go where this president of ours was. We've not done anything. I think just to add a little bit of that. Young people are giving ideas. Let's listen. Let's listen. <laughs> yeah. See, on the aspect of tourism, mm -hmm. he actually raises a very, very good point. Because how countries position themselves and how they market themselves, I Kenya. think also <laughs> solely lies on them. Let's, yeah. let's give an example of, I think, the most recent Olympics that happened in Japan, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. You realize that we were so glued to our screens to watch but you're not only watching the 42 kilometer marathon. These people would go that extra mile of showing you the universities yes. they yes. have, how their environment looks like in the morning. The and night the light evening. of Tokyo. Exactly. They show you all, you get that inspiration. You really Can I just ask you, a, can I ask you a rhetoric <laughs> question? <Yeah. laughs> um, a government, uh, Japan has a government, averagely, uh, I think the, the average age is 35. Mm -hmm. Government is young, and they have. But the population is old. old. Mm -hmm. They have progressive thinkers. A country like Uganda, <laughs> <we're> ideas. <laughs> they have nowhere to go. <laughs> Here we can have all these brilliant ideas, but but who is calling in the room? To <laughs> this is nothing. And like I said yeah. earlier, you see that blame game is an old act. We need to class. No, what have can to, we do? Yes, because here is the thing. Yeah. This setup alone mm. is enough evidence. Mm. Just, I think... You're backroom, becoming a motivational speaker. It is not even, it is not even <laughs> becoming a motivational yeah. Backroom discussion we had even before we started this yeah. was talking about how social media has become a necessary evil or something like that. Mm. You've seen how tourist influencers visit different places and advertise. But the young You've people do how... not have the capacity. No, 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 no. You also need very good cameras. You would Aside need... Aside from that, you, you need can data invest... And yet you have... Charges on Drake. Okay. I, I want to respond to both of them, but um, please. Twelve point five percent of uh, Ugandans out of the population that we have are the only people who have access to data, active access to data. Mm. We are around forty six million, a forty six million population. Seventy eight percent being young people, mm. young people who do not have access to phones because most of the population is rural based. Mm. The ideas we have here, they require stakeholders to implement them. The issue is that we do not have the ideas. We have the ideas. We have put them on social media. But how do you reach that stakeholder for them to implement them? Because we need a platform. That's just it. Because like Cynthia and Philip, you put it very well. Yeah, we need to take a deliberate effort to do something. And this is uh, where Ugandans come from. When you look at the tourism they have done, explore Uganda or anything. But how many people have taken the initiative to take it up as a country? This is why we talk about platform being very important. Nam, you do not have any side event organized by a young person. So, and true, maybe if you true. allow me, if you have 78% of a population mm -hmm. that cannot influence the decisions of that population, that Decisions are influenced dead. from where you have power. If yes. you do not have power and you're not inside a room, there is no way you can Post influence independence without Africa, being inside. You had great people. Mm -hmm. Nelson Mandela. He started Mkonto Wesiziwe. He was around 20 watts something. 28. Mm -hmm. Kwame Nkrumah. Mm -hmm. uh, Gamal Abdel Nasser, you can talk about him. Thomas talk about Sankara. Seko Ture, Thomas Sankara, mm -hmm. 33. Uh, All the young people. Young people. And they were able to draw a master plan in their mind of how they wanted their countries to look like. Thomas Sankara, in three years, 
the achievements he made for Burkina Faso, they have never achieved a quarter 30 years later, and perhaps they will never achieve. Kwame Nkrumah posted after six years what he was planning for the country with all his weaknesses, they have not achieved. He and was a president. Thomas Sankara was a president. And that's what I'm saying. Exactly. Can't this 78% produce a president? Okay, we shall agree with Jack after that. <laughs> so, 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 you see, people, um, for me, um, I hold the view that Uganda has very brilliant, exactly. energetic, innovative, hopeful, hardworking, determined young people. If they say we are giving... Um, chance to let's say Philip or Cynthia or Denise to be president Drake, for 100 days. I, I want to disagree with even before you complete <laughs> that statement. There is no one that is going to wake up and say, Philip, we've given you, come and I, become I, the president. I, I know, no! I know. I am, I am and just... they should not give us. And if you are given, <laughs> trust me, nothing is going to happen. But you shouldn't no, be given. No, the issue is, yes. the issue is, I'm just giving from an idealistic point of view. Mm. The ideas that young people have, are brilliant. Mm -hmm. But also the challenges that young people possess are enormous. Yes. You get, we have young people who possess very interesting and brilliant they ideas. They don't have platform. They don't have platform. But even if the young people are given platform, oftentimes they're carried away. Let me ask you. <laughs> let, 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 let me ask you. I think you. that you finally yeah. arrived. Let, of course, it happens. It happens. But, but <laughs> let me ask you. <laughs> then we go back to what? Protection is it? Let me ask you, just briefly. Yeah. I want you to help me check the last post you have on either Facebook or Twitter or TikTok mm -hmm. and yours and hers and maybe a couple of other young people and maybe your peers. You check their last post. What is it about? We have the NAM in the country. G77 is coming. A few weeks ago, we had the conference of speakers and presiding officers. Mm -hmm. We have a conflict in Gaza. We have a conflict in Ukraine. We have the World Trade this? Order. We have the United Nations. We have a, a, a case in, in the mm -hmm. ICJ. Mm -hmm. We have uh, very many things. 2026 is around the corner. I, I want you to check your last post. What is it saying? I want you to check yours and you check yours. What am I trying to say? What is the mind of the young people we are talking about? What consumes their time and attention and focus? Is it matters that portray what this country wants to get to? Or it is a, a TikTok challenge in but a dance? Ask, and, one could actually possibly argue mm. that it's by design. Um, it's by design that, as you argue, that we have this protectionism in place. And a design is, you get attracted to a design and you choose to take it on. It's because the, the mind of a young person mm -hmm. can be triggered in, in whichever way they want it to be. And for the young person or for the young Ugandan, you're given a gig, you're given this particular amount of money, you're okay, you don't even care where or how or how or what. All those questions that we should be asking ourselves are not asked. But nonetheless, let's just go for a short commercial break and then we'll be back and have this conversation going. We are discussing about what the NAM, the NAM summit means for the Ugandan youth, but also in the other half of the show, we'll be talking about South Africa's genocide case against Israel. Stay locked, be right back. National Water and Sewage Corporation is committed to providing cost-effective, clean, safe, and reliable quality water and sewage solutions in urban centers across Uganda. National Water and Sewage Corporation reaffirms its commitment to 100% service coverage, geographical expansion, infrastructure development, water quality, pro poor initiatives, customer care and stakeholder engagement, catchment, and water source protection. Be a water hero, pay your bills to zero balance, report all leaks, busts, and illegal water connections to enable us serve you better. Reach us through our toll-free numbers on 0800-200-977 or 0800-300-977. You can also communicate with us through any of our online platforms or visit the National Water and Sewage Corporation office nearest to you. This message is brought to you by National Water and Sewage Corporation. We'll come back from that break. Um, just before we went into the break, we've been discussing the NAM Summit and what it means for the Ugandan youth. And just as we broke off, we were having a very passionate debate here as regards to will it exactly pay off? Is it feasible? Will Ugandans benefit? In actual sense, we are representing the cries of the ordinary Ugandan. We are looking at the failures of uh, an aging government that doesn't have views and opinions of the young people. I think Denise said something very, 
very, very interesting that we have a NAM summit and we barely have a side event. Not even barely, we do not have a side event of young people. And yet, pressing international global issues are in regards to international peace and security, climate change, um, innovation, and mm -hmm. all those could be possible side events that young people could feature in. Unfortunately, we have heads of state and delegates representing their views. Um, Philip, just as we wind up on the topic on now, mm. what is your view? Um, mm -hmm. Moving forward, what recommendations do you have for Uganda and other NAM member states? Thank you. We do not have a side event for young people. You just say, she just said young people are the poorest, therefore, and organizing an event is capital requiring. It requires money, therefore young people do not have this money, therefore they cannot organize. But two, we have a Ministry of Youth Affairs in this country. Which is underfunded. <laughs> <laughs> I do not know how much lobbying they did. We have youth MPs, youth commissioners, youth. I don't know how much lobbying they did. It was denied. To that denied. effect. She says it was denied. I hope so. Way forward and recommendations for the NAM. Number one, NAM needs to evolve and match today's global standards. You are in a world that has, uh, well, once again is going bipolar or even multipolar, if, if you may like. Global challenges have evolved. At the time we were talking about the Korean War, we were talking about you know, the Cold War here and there, South Africa, uh, Israel, but today we have uh, new and bigger challenges, challenges of climate change, challenges of economics, people talking about uh, neo-colonialism and how it is affecting progress in some countries. You've seen states evolve in West Africa trying to cut that, you know, suppression by their former colonial master France. You know, you talk about um, the global world trade order and the Britain Wood sisters and how they impose their power over weaker nations on the planet. So that is all evolution. And you cannot be an institution of 120 countries covering a population of about 6.5 billion people and you do not want to evolve. You automatically rendering yourself irrelevant. Therefore, the NAM needs to evolve. The NAM, the NAM needs to set standards. The NAM needs to set rules and that have to be followed, followed by member states. Uh, you cannot be there and uh, it's a, a walk in and walk out. No, no checks and balances. It can't happen that way in the, in the kind of world we're in, especially when people have a lot of information. Nations have grown uh, military nuclear power. These are all new dynamics in geopolitical security and political discussions. Therefore, as now, if you want to remain relevant like you are in the next decade and century, you have to evolve and get to these standards. Yeah. Otherwise, uh -huh. you're Beautiful. Gone. Brilliant. Denise, recommendations for now? Well, I, I think one thing is very crucial and we need to agree the involvement of young people at whatever level or whatever high level discussion and platforms you need, you need to have young people for positive discourse. Because the issues that you're discussing are not issues um, that are going to affect you. They're issues that are going to affect the young people, the future generation to come. And if young people are not involved in the future that they desire, in the future that is theirs, then there is no way they are going to own up to whatever decisions or to whatever outcomes come out of now. There is a sense of ownership that needs to be fostered towards young people. Mm -hmm. There is an involvement that needs for young people. The second thing I think about now is, um, well, as much as we have neutrality, there is an aspect of unity and commitment, and like Phil had said it. Because if we do not have any consistency, 
that is existing, there is no way NAM is going to achieve and continuously achieve its 10 pillars on what it is based on. Mm -hmm. If you look at the human rights, sovereignty, you're going to look at all these principles, the pillars of NAM. If it is not for consistency, commitment, and continuous driving of the agenda of NAM within the member states, then it is not going to be one that is going to achieve its uh, principles and pillars that it's based on. Because just like we said, very few people know even what NAM means, yeah. and yet Uganda is a member state of NAM. Where does that leave all the other African countries? Like you say, 53 countries are over here. And this is something that you're not going to see going viral, like AFCON or anything. It's one that brings Africans together. Yeah. So we need it to foster more growth within, um, within maybe educating individuals what NAM means, what is it for the young people, and what are the opportunities presented with NAM. Yeah. Awesome. Cynthia? Recommendations. So I, I think I'd love to also encourage on the aspect of consistency. Yeah. And then on the aspect of civic engagement for youth. With consistency comes evolution. That means you understand what happens in these different countries, how they have grown, and what has declined. Therefore, you're able to tailor make the solutions to those individual countries, but also to generally address things, some of the principles ranging as far as wide to things like economy, political and societal issues. And then on the aspect of civic engagement for youth, I think it's important that in as much as governments want to create or portray a facade of advocating for youth involvement in most of their activities, they need to be a tad bit more practical through having things like civic education. People are introduced to things like NAM, especially for their youth in mm. high school, and that is if you choose to do history as a subject. So I think there needs to be a greater role played in creating the sort of education necessary to empower the youth to understand the diversities of the lobbying bodies that help them to push the agendas of their nations, that help them to push their individual and societal agendas. It needs to go far beyond the word of mouth. It needs to go far beyond the need to create an impression that young people are actually involved, and it needs to become a bit more practical. And then another thing I feel for NAM that needs to happen is prioritization. Far from host countries to member states, I think there is need to prioritize what your benefits would be. That means you're creating a sort of leveled assessment to understand that when this happens, what is the implication? If it's a negative implication, how best can we overcome it? Because certain things are necessary evils in themselves, but for a necessary evil to exist, which means that there needs to be a sort of outlined advantage for us to say we can trade off this for this. I think another thing when it comes to the aspect of consistency is having accountability. Mm. This means that, for example, if there is a Kampala declaration since we've had the summit happen in Uganda, is before that three years tenure expires, is there a sort of committee or a sort of separate meeting that is going to happen to evaluate that these were the resolutions? How far have countries come up to address these resolutions? Are they being impactful to these countries? Are they being impactful to these communities, to these societies? Are we doing a good job as an organization that stands together? Because we need to see progress. We need to see purpose for your existence. <coughs> so just in and out of itself, on aspects of accountability, civic engagement, we need to see a purpose for your existence as an organization. Uh, thank you. If you allow me yeah. a, a few seconds, y just two points. One, I think it's in your law where you have that principle of uh, strong nations where they talk about strong nations and their influence in the world. The countries of NAM must understand that for you to win a global geopolitical discussion and decision-making, you must be strong. 
and strength is not in terms of building muscle or something like that, but yeah, addressing the economics, addressing the security. Today we talk about getting a permanent representative from the UN Security Council. But the reason those guys are there, living along the historical, is uh, the capacity to threaten each other economically and militarily, the nuclear power, the size of the army and the equipment, the kind of use, the technology they have at their disposal. Mm. So the country is in now. I know India is driving that lane. I know Indonesia is sort of trying to catch up. I know Egypt is trying, but these countries must think about it thoroughly that in order for NAM to be recognized as a relevant body, they have to build their economics and make them viable and competitive at global stage. Because imagine the NAM. If, what, what does Uganda trade with, uh, for example, China? Yes, China brings a lot here. What do we take there? What do we take to France? What do we take to the United States? what we take to all these countries. So that's a, a point I wanted to make, that mm. we must work on our economics and make sure it is attractive economics. But number two, to re-emphasize the point of solidarity and consistency. You see, these countries that we try to counter, their solidarity is at a very high level. When they choose to attack Afghanistan, they will all go. It, it, it doesn't matter if one doesn't agree he has to go because they agreed we must work together. If they choose to attack, to, to send weapons to Ukraine to fight Russia, they will. If they choose to deny Uganda aid, they will. Solidarity, but the consistency too. They will tell you, Uganda, we are not happy. And all of them will deny you aid. So their embassies will start leaving. Their companies will start leaving your economy. They've done this with Russia. They are doing it with Uganda. They will strip you off Agoa. World Bank will stop giving you money. They will boycott covering your events like the NAM in the country. They've boycotted covering it. Not even a mention from them as leaders. You've not heard any of the presidents talk about it. Consistency. That's the power of consistency. Here in our countries, we don't have solidarity. Rwanda closes, closes its border with Uganda. South Sudan will be silent. Kenya denies access to, to the market of, you know, eggs and maize. DRC will be silent. Rwanda and DRC are soon fighting. Tanzania is silent. No one cares. It doesn't work for us. It works for them, actually. All right. Denise? Let's just shift gears and have the conversation on Israel, on um, South Africa's genocide case against um, against Israel, which was lodged last week, um, around around um, the eighth of January, ninth, there thereabout. Um, Israel brings a case against <coughs> South Africa. I mean, brings a case against Israel um, about the seventh October uh, incident that occurred, and. The case that they bring against Israel is one that looks at genocide. South Africa's um, diplomatic or international obligation to combating any apartheid-leaning agenda in the world is forever standing. And that, is, that fuels the obligation <coughs> excuse me, to bring this case against Israel. They allege and claim that what Israel is doing on Palestine is an extension of apartheid. Um, what is your, um, I just want you to bring the viewers who are non-lawyers and possibly are maybe hearing about this for the first time. Contextualize it for them. Well, uh, before I go into South Africa's case against uh, Israel, I would like to first put into context <coughs> that uh, prior to this, the world has failed Palestine. I mean, our shared humanity, building shared futures, the world has failed Palestine. Because if you look at uh, the kind of atrocities that have been committed within the Gaza Strip itself, even prior to the 7th October, the kind of uh, what had been happening for the past 70 years, you find every access in Gaza Strip is controlled by Israel, whether it is air, water, or by road, meaning the kind of food that you have getting into Gaza Strip is limited, but then to 
the continuous bombing, um, the continuous killing of largely children and women within the Strip is one yeah. that is not um, something. You see, the war in Gaza is not about what the future of Palestine looks like. It's what tomorrow looks like, is what today looks like. Because it is not yet certain. Um, you see, it's not about ascertaining whether it is a genocidal act by Israel, but it is about ending the war. Because I think it is not justified for you to continuously kill civilians, over 20,000, and then you're going to have two million being displaced and not having even where to stay after the war. So you need to find a middle ground where this war is going to end. It's not about whether it's a genocide or it's not about whether it is wrong, but we think that the war needs to end. Because even a question of tomorrow or the future is not what someone in Gaza wants to hear. It's about today, what is going to happen today. But putting into context, um, maybe for viewers uh, to understand uh, where South Africa is coming from against Israel, I think on 7th um, October when the Hamas and everything were fighting with uh, Israel, what happened were the kind of bombings. And Israel claims to have done this in form of defense. But after then, continuously people have been bombed schools have been bombed, hospitals, any fields or anything that could be used within Palestine, especially the Gaza Strip, does not exist. These are individuals who do not have where to go even after the war has ended because majority of their homes, their buildings are down. But then too, even to an extent where UN, um, UN agencies where journalists, where you're going to find that anyone trying to report against the <coughs> war is either censored or is going to be killed within the situation. So South Africa is coming from a background where children and women are being the most affected. Because when you look at the facilities that are existing within Gaza, even Palestine, the hospitals are being bombed down. Women are giving birth. 180 women give birth. In, in Palestine almost every day. And most of these, uh, 15%, most of them are likely to face uh, consequences or are likely to face problems while giving birth. So you find that this is not only just an act against, um, against getting but a humanitarian crisis. But then to looking at the kind of uh, humanitarian aid that is supposed to come within Palestine and the Gaza Strip, mm. you find that most of instances it has been continuously blocked. So they are having little or nothing to survive on. When it rains, they are struggling to actually collect water to drink. They are actually, children are drinking water from potholes. And you find this is something that is induced because if you're not allowing in humanitarian aid, it's not Hamas that is suffering. It's the civilians that are actually suffering. But then the third thing is using, um, is bombing facilities where human, uh, where civilians are usually. So South Africa's case against Israel is uh, majorly about that. And Israel's response is that, you see, what happens is that Hamas is using, um, is using civilians as a shield. That Hamas probably is headquartered in hospitals. Hamas is using UN offices as, um, as this, and they're calling it collateral damage of military action. I feel that's quite ridiculous because uh, if you say that uh, 2 million displaced civilians, over 20,000 individuals killed, even some of who have not been discovered until are still under the rubbles of the buildings, mm. and you're calling it mm. collateral damage. And you're saying it's just a consequence out of military action. I think it's not significant enough to prove as to why you're having those individuals in hunger, continuously inducing the starvation. Because I think right now, the humanitarian crisis in the world, the largest humanitarian crisis is existing, is existing in what? Is existing in Gaza Strip. Millions of individuals that are actually starving are existing in Gaza. Children and women that are likely to die and that have been killed in this 21st century are within the Gaza Strip within the few months that this war has been ongoing. But even for purposes of context, this is a war that has been happening since the 1960s. From the Seven Days War, you're having Gaza still uh, being affected and uh, all that being having the starvation that has been induced. And you have the ability to say 
But no, this is collateral damage. Uh, civilians that are being killed, we are sorry, but we're looking for Hamas. And Hamas was the first to attack, and we think that it's self-defense. You do not defend yourself against civilians. You do not defend yourself against children because they are not Hamas or they do not have any role or they have not done anything wrong to exist. And when you look at South Africa telling you that generations of individuals are being killed, where you have a child, uh, the aunt, the grandfather, and the future generation, or the babies all being killed, meaning you do not have any lineage that is going to exist within that family. It's a humanitarian crisis. It's something that we don't even need to discuss. It's something that needs to end. Not that um, even with the allegations or the claims that South Africa makes against genocide. I think just from our shared humanity and building shared futures, the war needs to end as soon as possible. We don't need to discuss what the future will look like because for someone in Gaza, they are not even certain of the future. Mm. They're not even certain where they're going to end the day alive. Yep. Powerful. Um, those are those are the views of Denise, and I'd also like to hear your views. Since I don't want to interfere at okay. this point, then I'll get to the Pan Africanists to give us a perspective of why South Africa is justified. Okay, so first of all, when you listen to the lawyers representing South Africa, you understand that everything they present is to show you an urgency for the war to stop the whole dictation of what a genocide looks like and how intentional each action Israel decides to carry out is. The point in all this is how fast can the war stop? Like Denise mentions, these people are not worried about the future. The question is, how will I finish the day? How am I going to sleep? Will I even sleep? Children are all over different platforms, from social media to the news, losing their parents in their face. So I feel like the audacity to even say this is self-defense, when it is clear that you have a more authoritative army or a stronger military, the whole idea of self-defense becomes an excuse to intentionally execute and murder children and women just generally. So we feel like there is a need for this war to stop as soon as it can because people are losing their lives, children are dying. And it is, it is a very sick and saddening situation that even South Africa as a nation doesn't have to justify why it is best put to even present the genocide case. I think it is more of how fast can this war end? And we need to stop the rhetoric of sitting and folding arms and even say we are listening to what the atrocities these people are facing are mm -hmm. when they're extremely evident. Like the lawyers go ahead to detail intentional statements from a prime minister within Israel, a president, members of the cabinet, ministers, as far as why does military people. I th there is an explicit video that shows the Israeli army jubilating and talking about how there is need to, um, annihilate. to annihilate all these people and remove them from the Gaza Strip, like to seize their entire existence. So when we see such things, and on top of that, you're seeing that the highest number of people that are dying are women and children. This is already an attack on the existence of these people, right? That is why there is that humanitarian crisis that is already existing. Even to add your self-defense, I don't think you're going to defend yourself over someone that is weaker than you and then intentionally refuse aid to move into these countries to help people. You're seeing on the news that when food reaches, even before it reaches the destination, people are grappling for this food. That is even in the best case scenario that it even reaches the destination. So I feel like more attention needs to be paid to the fact that even aside from South Africa presenting the genocide case, there is a huge humanitarian crisis where Israel needs to pay heed to it and stop the war. The self-defense aspect is just a sorry excuse 
to continuously murder people that can't defend themselves. From October up until now, it's been the same excuse. Hamas is using civilians as human shields. Does it mean you need to kill these people? It's saddening and it really pushes the world to a point where you, you question things like protection of human rights and if it's something that is even valid at this point. Just like how we're questioning things of, of whether sovereignty is necessary when people are suffering, mm -hmm. right? The question then becomes to all the organizations, countries that are ruled by democratic principles, if they are not willing to take a stand to say, this is a humanitarian crisis and we need to all stand together as the globe to make sure that what is happening to these Palestinian children, to these Palestinian mothers stops rather than playing the geopolitics of who is siding with who to do what, just the understanding that these are children dying. Mm. It's basic sense to know what a genocide looks like when you see one intentionally starving people, killing young children, mothers that are giving birth do not even have just the basic access to health care to produce children. This already shows you the eminent threat on the existence of Palestinians. And I think aside from history and how people want to document the fact that who attacked who first, the question now is, are you willing to comfortably sleep at night knowing that the blood of a child is on your hands? Are you willing to comfortably sleep at night knowing that there is someone that is on their knees, probably reciting a surah, reciting a novena and saying, God, help me end the day. Help me move to another day. It's really, really disturbing because still it is going to have a global impact because you're creating a refugee influx. These people are looking for the safest place to run. We are already complaining about how much of a lag countries are facing in addressing things like poverty, excessive populations. So we are comfortably allowing a brew of further problems to mount from something that can't be stopped, but the actors intentionally choose to continue killing people and not stop the problem at hand. True. Sure. Um, that's, uh, I've listened to you two ladies and I feel like, okay, she go on and on and on and on. Then you have something to say. Yeah, uh, so before <coughs> when I made a statement and said that uh, the world has failed, has failed Palestine. Not because, because the biggest countries that have the ability to actually end this war and put an end to it, like the US or the UK, have continuously taken a neutral stand or voted against any effort to end the war. Anyway, I wouldn't defend the US because the biggest export of the US are war crimes, wherever they are or whatsoever they do. When you look at countries like Libya, Afghanistan, Afghanistan Yemen, Syria. Syria, what they have continuously done in these countries does not even give them the moral authority to actually condemn any country that is talking about the kind of uh, things that are going on. But the fact that they have remained neutral and voted against any ability to end the war, any effort to end the war in um, Gaza is one that shows the kind of hypocrisy, the kind of democracy that they preach is uh, not, is shitty for lack of, a, lack of a better word, and is one that is actually a, facade. a failure to humanity, to the shared humanity that we all have here. All right, uh, let's listen in from the gentleman. When you ladies are submitting, um, he looked very sad. And <laughs> let's listen in to that uh, submission. Okay. I'll start by uh, sending an apology to the people of Palestine for I, my countrymen, my fellow Africans, and the whole of humanity has let you down. I apologize on my own behalf and on behalf of everyone that thinks you have a right to life. <clears throat> you have a right to shelter, to food, to health care, to education, 
to self-determination. I'm really sorry. And I hope and promise myself to do better in supporting you. Secondly, I want to correct what she just said, that the UK and the United States have taken a neutral stand. No, they've not taken a neutral stand at any one point. They actually, the reason the people of Palestine are dying, they are the reason. They provide the money, they provide the moral support, they provide the weapons, they even provide security for any access that can come in to help the people of Palestine in the name of putting warships on the seas to make sure anyone that is bringing help for the people of Palestine in Gaza and the occupied Western West Bank, that help cannot reach. So they have never been neutral. You see, even as uh, an elder, when you have a sibling at home, when you do something that is unfair to that child or to anyone, back on your mind you feel it and you know it, that I'm oppressing this person and you cannot be comfortable as a human being. You cannot be comfortable and two, you cannot be guaranteed of your security if the security of that person you're oppressing is not guaranteed. The people of Israel, the occupation of force in Gaza and the occupied West Bank, know at the back of their minds that they can never have security if the people of Palestine do not have security, if there is no state with clear boundaries, like we say now we should consider the boundaries of 1967, there is no security for both peoples. I have grown up being taught how ugly, how inhuman the Holocaust was. How the Jews were mistreated, how they were killed, how they were displaced. I'm yet to be convinced it was more shabby than what I see in Gaza today. I need more convincing. I've always thought it was the deadliest form of inhumanity to man by a fellow man. But now I think my thoughts are quite a little different. And perhaps someone will need to convince me more. When you say the people of Palestine <clears throat> have no right to live where they are, but then you say a person who was displaced from the Holocaust from somewhere in Europe has a right to stay in that region. You are the lawyers. I don't know how to call that case. But mm. I call, they call, they call, in law, the adverse process. <laughs> <laughs> so it, so you will assist me in that. Yes. Killing. She talked about, they talked about the killing of children and women and men too are killed. <laughs> These people have not stopped there. They kill babies in life support machines. They bomb hospitals. They bomb it again. They bomb a refugee camp. They kill people not only with guns and bombs, with even machetes. Children, they arrest five-year-olds, 10-year-olds, because a 10-year-old has said you were a bad person. Are you a good person by killing his mother and father? Then you arrest that one. I was looking at when there was a prisoner exchange, the people Israel was releasing people of 15 year olds and what was the case this person was arrested because he said you israel officer you're a bad person are you human do you value life i don't know you do not earn 
If I come to what South Africa has done at the ICJ, first of all, I want to say the leadership of the, of the uh, ANC has never been to the top the way it is today. I've never been more as proud by the ANC as I am today. The effort they are putting, yes, I know, even when they win this case, it has to be taken to the UN Security Council for them to vote on it. And we know if South Africa wins and there is a vote in the UN Security Council, chances that the voting will go, the war of the people of Palestine are very limited because it is in the control of the people that do not care about human life people that do not care about the life of children, the life of women, the life of mothers, pregnant women. I doubt if it will pass, but in any case, whether it passes or it doesn't pass, it is a statement to the world that actually, she called it hypocrisy, but you know, normally they say that politicians never live by what they say. They say something during day and the night, they change their color. There's a group of people and nations that say something in the Ukraine-Russia conflict. And they purport to be pro-life and human rights and they want the sovereignty and education and how do you deny a people a right to self-determination for 70 years? And you say you are democratic, and you say you support human rights, and you call yourself the global leader. That's a contradiction. That's a contradiction. So it is unfortunate, the incident in Gaza, and of course, you saw even the Israeli team, the, the, the state agents of Israel at the ICJ, shivering. They, you know, before the case, the, 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 the Israeli team was all up there and being praised. Oh, we got these guys, Professor Malcolm Shaw, and he's uh, the best lawyer in the world. And a guy came to the floor and he didn't have what to defend. Meaning deep inside, they know. This is, you can't defend this. You have nothing to defend. Mm. You don't have what to defend. They know. He couldn't speak. He started saying how he doesn't see his notes and someone <laughs> has taken not. away his notes. <laughs> <laughs> he had nothing to defend because there's nothing to defend in there. Mm. And therefore, dear Palestine and dear peoples of the world, humanity still exists. And it counts on us. The decisions we take today in saving the people of Palestine is a decision for humanity. And your position on that matter is very important for life to continue on this planet. Thank you. Powerful. Um, we have reached the end of the show, but I'll just quickly um, let each of you in 60 seconds just say your concluding remarks and um, your parting shots. I'll start with you, Cynthia. And I'll conclude with the gentleman right there. Okay, um, thank you very much, Greg. It's been a pleasure to be on the show and to express all these views. I think my 60 second takeaway is to the youth out there that certain things are not going to come on a golden platter. Activate yourself and push yourself to be in spaces where you're able to vocalize things that need to be heard and need to be acted on. But aside from that, I am glad to have the opportunity to share my views and just to even learn as well because there is an importance in just being in spaces where you can learn. Use your time and use it wisely. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, it's always a pleasure to be on the show, definitely. Well, um, as we end the show, my remarks would be that uh, we have a shared humanity, we have a shared future, and all of us need to play a role in making sure humanity still exists and to make sure that uh, there is something that we can always add to any voice or any right that needs to be protected. 
But then the second thing is that um, as the NAM conference is going on, we need more youth involvement and we need more opportunities showcase the same way you're going to post the president on Twitter, post those opportunities for young people. Thank you. Okay. Yes, thank you, Drake. Uh, I want to say one for the NAM, dear Ugandans, let's, let's take advantage of the opportunity before they know us the economic, the political, the influence we can get out of it, let us position ourselves and benefit from it. Young people, it's never going to be thrown your way. You have to fight for it. Whether it's pushing into the state house, you have to, for you to achieve what you want, to, a desired future for yourselves. No one is going to throw it your way. I want to encourage if the opportunity is there for anyone in the decision-making circles of the non-aligned movement, I would want to see in the Kampala Declaration a distinctive statement about the state of Palestine. You know, a couple of things have happened, but people keep referring to the Oslo Accords, 1993, 95. And the state of Israel has continued to say that very many things have changed, the boundaries have changed, now that is no longer applicable. But I want to say we need a state of Palestine as much as we needed it yesterday. And it can't wait. We can't have it tomorrow. We can't have it the following day. We need it today for the people of Palestine to have a chance to live to have education, to have health care. We need that. And whoever is privileged to make decisions that can affect that, please, you can only be human. Thank you. Um, we have had the views. Thank you very much, Philip Melissa, Ayere Denise, and uh, Esther Cynthia Apili for taking time to join us in this conversation. I'm very happy and thrilled that I was impatient to host all of you. This has been um, Inter-University Interface, and I'm Douglas Strekunen, your host for today. See you next week, same time, same place. Bye-bye.